Amen. Good morning. And if you have your Bibles, yes, I am home. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I've been going. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. I'm going to do a, uh, another lesson. Pastor Stephen will continue starting next week and finish out his series. But I want to do one more lesson uh, this will, uh, as part of our Memorial Stones series. And so the point of this is uh, the Bible is very insistent about memory, that you remember. And you remember things because that is how you know whether you're staying on track. And so what I'm doing in this is uh, it's not so, much, uh, not so much a teaching but I'm telling stories. And what I'm doing, I began with my parents' uh, lives and, and then uh, we're looking at their ministry. And so out of this, then we pull lessons. There are things that we do in our church. There are ways that we approach uh, the preaching of the gospel that actually have a history. And it's very important for us to know those. And so today, this will be the third, and uh, today's lesson will just cover two years, 1968 to 1970, which brings us up whenever I uh, do another lesson. We'll start with Prescott. Let's get to Joshua 4, and 4 through 7, this is our verse that tells us about uh, memorials. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe, and Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, so we're talking about the early years here. We wound up in the last lesson. Uh, my parents pastored in a very small farming community called Emmett, Idaho. That was from 66 to uh, 68. And uh, overall, I think my parents had uh, good memories uh, of Emmett and the people there. The people in the church were primarily very nice church people. The majority of them, almost all of them, were simply raised in church, and that was their background. So the focus of the church, if you are not a sinner saved, what can happen is their focus is let's just have a nice environment to raise kids. And so the church, I explained uh, last week, my dad in Bible school had been uh, taught that the approach, how you're going to win the world is through children's programs. In the church in Emmett, they followed that, but uh, more than a denominational emphasis, this is how the people thought. They're raised in church. They're nice church people. We want our kids to be raised in church and be nice people. So very much the focus was on children's programs. But I told in the first lesson, my parents were not raised in church at all. Both of them said they only ever remember going to church twice as children their entire lives. They were sinners that had been uh, transformed by Jesus. I was digging looking for a photo yesterday for, for this and came across some photos of my mom uh, kissing somebody else. So <laughs> that was, <laughs> there's like, wow, there you go. Dad really was a sinner. Okay. <laughs> that was before he met my mom, of course, before they were married. But so because they were converts, always what my parents wanted, they wanted to see conversion. They wanted people to get saved. And that, by and large, wasn't happening. They had some good things happen, but mostly it was just pastoring nice church people. That's valid, but that was not what my dad 
really wanted to do. I, I mentioned last week, he started talking to pastor of a four-square church in, a, in Eugene, Oregon. This man was from Idaho, and he owned a business. I, I, I don't recall exactly what it was, but it was connected to dairy farming. I don't know if it was a feed business or whatever, but he was pastoring in Oregon, but keeping his business going in Idaho. And he really wanted, he was coming close to retirement. He wanted to move closer to his business. And in speaking to my father, he knew that dad was not uh, happy in Emmett. And so he proposed, why don't we swap churches? I'll take the church in Emmett, which is near my business, and I'm from that area. You take the church in Eugene, Oregon. And so I'm sure they must have spoken to the supervisors. You can't just do that on your own. But nonetheless, in 1968, my parents did that. They swapped churches and they moved to Eugene, Oregon. I just have one photo. Not a lot of photos exist. They, anybody from Eugene, they call this the big snow. It snowed four feet in a month. It, then in one night, it snowed two feet. Uh, I only have two memories of this. I was four and five at this time. And that dad, the, the roof was flat. Dad had to shovel the snow so it didn't collapse, which meant we built monster mounds which had caves and steps and slides. And that's all I remember uh, about it. But dad did tell me lots of stories about Eugene. So here's a lesson that we're gonna learn that affects us even to this day. And that lesson is having a midweek service. In those days, it was extremely rare to have a midweek service. Most churches or the churches that dad pastored, what they had was not a preaching service or worship service. What they had was a midweek prayer meeting. And dad said, whatever size the church was, very few people attended the prayer meeting. Their idea of a prayer meeting was the pastor would speak for a few minutes. He would give a few thoughts or teach on prayer for a few minutes. And the idea was, okay, now let's turn our seats around and everybody pray. But dad said what actually happened was he would teach for a few minutes. He would turn his chair around and pray. Remember an early lesson I taught, he always had a passion to pray. But he said basically everybody listened. They listened to him pray, they'd do that for a while, and then they would all go home. So one night in one of these meetings, dad is, is there with the people and he said, this is pointless. I'm teaching on prayer, no one's praying. So he said, turn your chairs around. Instead of having a prayer meeting, he said, I'm gonna preach. And so he preached a sermon just off the cuff on a Wednesday night, and he said the response was so good, people were so enthusiastic about that, the following Sunday he announced, on Wednesday we are gonna have church. We're not gonna have a prayer meeting, we are having a midweek service, and he said many more people came out to hear the preaching than would have come out to a prayer meeting. And so what dad saw was that in a midweek service, <clears throat> there were needs in people that were being met. Let's get a verse, Romans 16, 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. Okay, in this scripture, I want you to notice what uh, Paul is saying. He says the message is supernatural. What we preach is supernatural in itself, but it also says the establish is, is to put down roots or to make stable. He says, and that happened through the preaching of Jesus Christ. So the message is supernatural. The preaching is supernatural, and then what dad always contended for was altar calls, is people respond. In our churches, we altar calls at the end of the service. We don't just end the service with a song. We don't just bow our heads and close in prayer and go home. 
we believe the altar is a place where you respond to what God told you. That's biblically actually what altars were. And so uh, dad said that is powerful. And he never moved away from that. That of course is, uh, is a part of ours. You can look for yourself. Uh, proportionately, very few churches have midweek services. But in our fellowship, dad said this is crucial to us and so that was a lesson, and that is where our midweek services began. Second lesson had to do with corporate prayer meetings. Now, for us, if you have gotten saved, or you've been in our church, you understand for us, prayer meetings are foundational. We pray here Monday through Saturday early in the morning. The normal prayer time is seven, but some people who start early go. That's six days a week. On Sunday, we have prayer uh, before the evening service. And then we also have prayer before each evening service, regularly Wednesday. And then that would be, of course, um, in revival we do each night. So again, in dad's background, that, that is not what happened. The prayer meeting that I just described to you, it was one night a week. Prayer meetings took two different forms. And uh, it varied. Each church he took before he came to Prescott varied like this. The first form of a corporate prayer meeting was one by one prayer. That means generally people stand or sit in a circle you pray one by one. So what that means is, okay, it's your turn. You pray when you finish the person next to you. Now, some of you, that would be your idea of hell, wouldn't it? <laughs> to have to pray out loud. And, and dad saw this is the problem. There were people that were intimidated. This is partly why prayer meetings were so poorly attended because they were terrified that someone was going to say, you pray, right? So natural fear, then a lot of it is like, nope, I'm not coming. Then, of course, if you're praying one by one, that limits what you pray for, right? Are you going to, prayer is talking to God about all kinds of issues. Are you going to be honest in your prayer in front of everybody else? Are you going to confess your sin, your failings? God, I'm a lazy, worthless, no... No, you're not going to do that. Are you going to out loud be praying about your personal struggles, your family problems, your marriage problems, your embarrassing physical condition or whatever? No, you're not going to do that. And what happens in a one-by-one -one prayer meeting is it can tend to make prayer a performance. Just out of curiosity, have any of you ever been to that kind of prayer meeting where they pray one by one? Okay, so not too many of you. So what happens is people aren't real. Okay, so it becomes like this. Is people, when it's their turn, they tend to sound religious. You want to impress people. You don't just pray and say, God, we need help, and I'm asking you to, to come down in power and save my... No, that's... Not, People pray like, that. oh, omnipotent one who reigns in Shekinah glory. And the next guy is like, man, I see your Shekinah glory. I'm going to raise you up. <laughs> I, I did that when I was pioneering. We, uh, I went, I wanted to put some advertising. I don't know why I thought this was a good idea. I want to advertise on a Christian radio station. I had a raw con. He was a sinner. And so... They said, well, uh, we, we can't talk to you now. We're about to have a prayer meeting. Would you like to join us? And I said, okay, this is an education for my convert. His eyes grew wide as they pronounced words. He had no idea what they meant. But it was like that. It was a performance, and clearly there were some people. It was pride. Some of them is like, are you ever going to shut up? Because this is your chance to, to uh, shine. So dad recognized one by one is not a good form of a prayer meeting. Or the second is what I said uh, that he discovered is that it, it is when the pastor teaches on prayer and then the people are supposed to pray afterwards. But 
uh, they wind up actually just listening to the pastor. I told you in, I think, the first lesson, my dad was impacted by uh, a husband and wife evangelistic team. They were both evangelists. Foursquare, of course, had uh, women pastors and, and preachers. Wayne and Mary Jane Westberg, when they preached for my, uh, my parents in Wickenburg, Arizona, I think I told you this, they prayed before church. This, this didn't, that's not the way the church was. They came early and they prayed. They marched up on stage, turned chairs around, and they prayed. They prayed boldly and they prayed out loud. And that so impressed dad, he said, they are establishing a spiritual atmosphere. They were used in the gifts of the spirit. They prayed for the sick. They preached with the anointing. People got saved. But dad said the prayer created the atmosphere, created the climate. So out of this, dad said what needs to happen in a church is we need corporate prayer meetings. You need to pray privately on your own, but we need corporate prayer meetings. Let's find this in the Bible, Acts 4, verse 24 and 31. So when they heard that they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And when they had prayed, uh, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Okay, I want you to notice what's happening here. When they heard, that's a crowd, they raised their voice to God. The crowd, they all prayed. And what happens is the Spirit of God came down. So out of that, my dad said, what needs to happen is we need to have corporate prayer meetings. Pray privately, you need to but you need to pray corporately. And some of you, if your only prayer form is praying by yourself in your house, you actually are not following the Bible pattern. There's something powerful about gathering together with other believers, and at the same time, we are calling out on God. And one of the main reasons is what happens in the service is affected by our prayer. Please remember that. This is one of the things I want you to understand in our, uh, in our church, trying to give the, the understanding. You coming to church is not watching. It's not a spectator. Okay, pastors, you do your thing. Worship people, you do your thing. No, no, we are all in this together. What happens in a service depends partly on people who establish God's presence in prayer meetings. So my dad began to establish corporate prayer meetings. Next lesson had to do with the hunger for conversions, and I've mentioned this in each of the lessons I've said. In Eugene, dad continued the four square emphasis on children's programs. They, the scripture out of Ezekiel, a little child shall lead them, which is it's actually a millennial scripture, kind of a dumb scripture to apply to your life today. But nonetheless, they believed if you have kids programs, you'll win the world. The adults will get saved if you can get kids to church. So what this meant is they had competitions. They had scripture memory competitions. They had uh, often it was who could bring the most visitors uh, to church. I, I was searching for these photos somewhere in the family. They've disappeared, but we had pictures of uh, people breaking records. I got to explain for kids. There used to be these black things called, they were on vinyl. They, were, they went around like this, and that's where music came from. We had a picture uh, that I can't find now, but it was breaking a record over the pastor's head because someone had broken the record for bringing visitors or something like that. My sister, when I asked Rhonda, one of her memories is she remembers the giant candy bar that someone won uh, for scripture memorization or, or something like this. So the idea was if you get kids in, you will automatically get 
the parents. And so my dad, he had enough of this. He went through all of these uh, programs. And what he said is, in actual fact, what's happening, we can invite all the neighbor kids to come to be in Sunday school programs, but he said what's actually happening is their unsaved parents, we're just providing free babysitting. The parents didn't go, oh, the kids are in church, I need to be in church too. They thought, I have a free hour at least. And Dad said that's, that's clearly not working and uh, it wasn't bringing in the parents wholesale, but um, uh, so he just he came to feel this was not the approach that he wanted. And again, the mark of my parents' ministry was they wanted sinners to be saved. My parents were sinners, raw sinners with no church background. And what they wanted to see was people saved like them, delivered from sin and living for Jesus. In Eugene, Oregon, he had a revival. I, I've mentioned his name several times with a man named John Metzler. This is Brian Nicely's grandfather. Uh, this is Jolene's father. They had uh, uh, met each other, knew each other from uh, Bible school. John Metzler had an incredible supernatural dimension. Uh, he came to Eugene and held a series of meetings that dad said were absolutely fantastic. The first thing that happened is sinners got saved. Dad, looking back, this is uh, probably 1969 by this point. Dad felt it's possible that this was actually the stirrings in America, the Jesus movement, Young people started getting saved across America starting in about 1968. Dad said, it's well possible this was something, it wasn't simply the result of advertising. Young people came, lots of people got saved. And so this was a, a part perhaps of the, the, the Jesus movement. And so this is exactly what my dad had been longing for Sinners are coming, not nice church people, sinners. Many people got saved. John Metzler was used powerfully in the gifts of the Spirit. Phenomenal uh, gift ministry in that way. And miracles of healing. One of these uh, that happened, one major miracle is John Metzler prayed for a man with a short leg. This was not a back adjustment it was a short leg. Now, uh, I, I wish that, that I had dad here to confirm facts, but I, had, I have prayed for someone and seen their leg and cut out, grow two inches, and I remember whatever story, I don't want to exaggerate it. Like, he grew seven feet in one, no, I don't want to exaggerate, but it was more than two inches, and I think from memory, it was actually more than three inches. It was a birth defect, and this man's leg grew supernaturally. That was John Metzler's ministry. He just had a touch of God uh, on him. But now the problems began. The problem of opposition. The previous pastor, I don't know if it was the, the dairy farmer guy or if it was someone before his time, had taught the people, there's a very small church, he taught them some false doctrines. The first thing he taught them was, we are supposed to stay small. Our church is not supposed to grow. Now, I know human nature you know why he taught them that it was God's will that they stay small? Because the church was really small. And he didn't want anybody asking him, Pastor, how come the church isn't growing? So you make a doctrine out of it. That's God's will. God's into quality, not quantity, brother. So now you have this revival with John Metzler and sinners are flooding this small building. So this creates a crisis because these people were glad to be part of the small quality. And this is 
throwing their world into disarray. So does that mean that we're violating God? So instead of being thrilled, the people were upset that visitors were coming and getting saved. The second thing that this pastor or some previous pastor had taught them, he taught them against the supernatural. He taught them that miracles were not of God and no longer were to take place. So now John Metzler comes, miracles are happening, sinners are getting saved, so the people in that church began to push back. They began to fight Dad, they openly opposed the miraculous. A man came to my father to complain about the healings. He was upset that people got healed, and my dad was incredulous. This was, the, again, you, you've seen people pray for short legs, and it's a back, this was a literally short leg. It was absolutely super, my dad was like, didn't you see that leg? And he said, the man in stubborn unbelief said, I don't know what I saw. This guy can walk evenly now. He doesn't limp. I don't know what I saw. Just rejected it. It is not uh, God. The other thing that happened is, of course, they had uh, a church council. And these people, because the church was small, they were used to wielding power. They were used to making decisions and kind of running things. And so now they began to pressure my dad against having new people, sinners, get saved and began to pressure him against having the supernatural. So here's the next lesson that affects us even today, and that is the need for spiritual support. I've mentioned this uh, in a couple of lessons. I, I, I want to tell you this is actually profound, a profound lesson into the structure of our church and how we operate in our whole fellowship. Okay, dad was from a denomination. Denomination is a, is a collection of churches, people who believe the same. That's the technical definition. But the denomination actually worked against my father and his ministry because, I explained this, I think, in the last lesson, you weren't sent out by your local church. It wasn't your pastor recognizing the call of God, working with you, training you, and then sending you out, and we're all a part of your ministry it was, I feel the call, you went away from the local church, we didn't see you for years, and then the denomination, headquarters, who often would be people you don't know them, they said, we have a church in Idaho, we have a church in Oregon, we have a church, you know, uh, all, all things like that. So, and, and then the other thing was you had an area supervisor, a state or several states. It could be a man, he was in charge. He was the supervisor of all those churches, but you didn't really have a relationship with him. A supervisor often was not a pastor at that time. When you became a supervisor, you stopped pastoring. You're now a desk jockey. You do business, you can answer questions, but you're not involved in pastoral ministry. I'm, I don't know that, I can't speak for 100%, but the ones that my father came in contact with, that is how uh, uh, they uh, operated. So, now you have a problem. I, I've described my dad getting frustrated. He had no spiritual support. So now think about it. This is not how we operate we train men in-house. We raise up couples in-house, uh, couples out of this church. I personally train them, work with them uh, to some degree. Then we send them out together. We're praying for them together. We're, they're not just lost in space. So, remember that guy who used to come? No, we're, they're connected. We bring them back. We pray for them. We put their pictures on the screen. But here's a very important issue. 
spiritual support. If a pastor was to call me and say, the people are fighting sinners getting saved, they're fighting the miraculous, I could support. I remember very clearly, Pastor Jesse took over a church and the previous pastor had put numbers of unhealthy things. He called me. So number one, I have affection for Jesse. I trained him. I got skin in the game. It's not just, he's not a number. I, I, I love this couple. Jesse and Beth, I wanted to help them. Secondly, I am a pastor. I currently am involved in working things out and I understand how things operate in a church. So I helped Jesse. This is what you should do. This is what you should preach. That problem person who's fighting you, this is how you handle them. And Jesse did a, a masterful job in dealing with that. The church went on, we survived, and things changed. My father didn't have that. So he felt isolated and alone, and he became increasingly frustrated. And so now, for the second time, my dad came and he said, I just, I can't do this. I can't, I don't know what to do. It's not how I want to be but he didn't know how to handle it because he felt he had no support. Now, this is something we'll talk about in later lessons. When my father began to plant churches, many of the ways that he began to plant them was out of his personal negative experiences. He said, headquarters making decisions, sending people away and having nothing to do with a local church or their pastor does not work. We can't do it that way. And so that becomes formative in how we plant churches. So you have to understand my dad is becoming increasingly frustrated, desperate in what do we do. Here's a lesson that I want to give you. And this is profound for his life, but also for yours. And that is God sees the future. Right now, you may be struggling your world revolves around today. That's what's happening with my dad. He goes to church. These people are fighting him. They don't want sinners to get saved. They don't want people to get, get healed. But at the same time, God sees the future. He plans the future and he controls the future. I want to, the next picture here I want to show you. This is of, again, Foursquare had husband and wife evangelistic uh, teams. Uh, probably a good thing we didn't stay in Foursquare. Mom would have had to dress like this till she died, but uh, nonetheless, this was a, uh, uh, a couple. This is Dick and Betty Mills. This man had been a, a missionary on the table. He's pointing to, he had been a, a missionary in, in Central America, and they had a, uh, he was kind of emphasizing that night missions. But Dick Mills, had a very powerful and unique gift ministry. The gifts of the Spirit for Dick Mills would operate. He would preach or teach whatever he was doing. But he would call people out and he would give them a scripture from the Bible and then prophetically he would speak about the future. And, and this man had the goods. It was... Powerful. I'm going to show you some pictures, my dad's Bible. Let's show me the first picture here if you put it up. If you'll notice on the left, it says Eugene, September of 1968. He had a revival, so now he is battling. These people are fighting him, and Dick Mills said, Is not the Lord your God with you? My dad, I, I don't think my dad, I know how he operated. He wouldn't have got him and said, let me tell you about these people. Now set your heart to, and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise and build the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the house that is to be built. And so Dick Mills gave him a word from this scripture. And he said, God is with you. But he began to speak about a house that is to be built. Not just talking about now. He was talking about the future. 
Second, uh, second one here, Dick Mills, 1968. He said this was repeated in 1972. Look at this. Your latter end should greatly increase. This is powerful because you're talking of pastoring a church of 25 to 30 people. Okay, there's nobody that would have come and seen my dad in this tiny, tiny group of people, tiny building, or it wasn't a very big building. You would not look and go, man, that guy is going to impact the world. But Dick Mills had the gift of the Spirit operating. He said, your latter end is going to greatly increase. In other words, your life is not simply what is going on in your life right now. Future fruitfulness is what this man was speaking about. Uh, the third picture I want you to see. And here, again, Eugene, 1968. The house of the Lord was set in order. And he was speaking to my father, and he, and he was talking about your ministry is going to be setting things in order. And I, I want to tell you, this is, that was powerfully prophetic. Okay, the Jesus movement breaks out across America. It was very, very loose. You can read uh, books, God's Forever Family, a book I, I powerfully recommend, highly recommend to you. It tells the history of the Jesus movement, where it came, how it impacted America. Incredibly loose, and what you will discover is most of the places where they had great revival, they didn't hold on to it over time. It was like, wow, all these people floated in, but then they floated out. This is partly the nature of hippies. Hippies, they were traveling around the country. They wanted to float in and float out. But my father in his ministry, God said, you're going to set things in order. So when hippies began to get saved, they're like, you know what? I'm going to float off to Ohio and witness to my family and get people saved along the, along the way as I hitchhike. My father would challenge them, no, you need to plant yourself. If you want to survive over time, you need to be rooted and planted in the gospel. And so many of those hippies, and some of them were you, put down roots here and are still saved today. Ministry. There were people that we, we originally, in the Jesus movement here in Prescott, it came out of music ministry. We had a band the Eden, that uh, four young guys, they had gotten saved and uh, began to minister for God. And so immediately, other churches started saying, come here, do this, do that, people not connected. And so they were like, cool, we're just going to travel around and play. And my dad said, no, if you want to be effective, you are going to commit yourself to a local church. And you're going to be here every service. We're going to invest in a concert ministry, but not a floating concert ministry. He set things in order, and that was powerful. One of the thing, marks of hippies is they floated around sponging off other people, right? Let somebody else give me money so I can eat, and my dad began to challenge and set things in order. You need to work a job. Work is godly and that was uh, very very powerful so the reason why i point that out you can read in the jesus movement the majority of the churches that experienced a wave of the spirit did not retain it very few calvary chapel is one we are another major movement that they were able to retain but partly that is because of my father setting things in order. Next scripture. This is the final one that I see in my dad's uh, uh, Bible. And uh, he gave him this word, and this was very profound. They that shall be of thee, my dad read King James till he died. They that shall be of thee 
shall build up the old waste places. You'll raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Dick Mills gave my father this word and he said, this scripture is going to be the mark of your entire ministry. That is what you are going to do. Now, let me explain this. Many churches, if you, if you read publications or you watch uh, you know, other ministries uh, online, you'll see what often they're so excited about is new things. God's doing a new thing. And often what they mean by the new thing is we're getting rid of the old thing. Right? Oh, we don't do that anymore. We're doing, God's doing a new thing. The things that have made our church and our fellowship powerful is not new things. Okay, my father came. All he did is he built up waste places, which he said, to, he interpreted that. The Prescott Church had been greatly damaged. And when he came in, it began to be repaired. But then you're going to raise up the foundations. You're going to restore the paths to dwell in uh, and uh, uh, so, there, and the, finally, the rest, what's the other one there? The repair of the breach. The things that we do, it's not like we invented them. We did not invent witnessing. Right? It's like, no way. You do what? You talk to sinners? That's not, that's not new to us. But my father began to establish it as a regular. Matt sent me a video of people street preaching downtown. It's not like nobody in the world has ever street preached. But my father began to put that in place. Evangelism, prayer meetings, actually the power of the local church, church planting. None of these were unique or new. But that man saw in the spirit and he said, that is going to mark your whole ministry. Okay, and the reason why I point that out is not only that it came true, this man spoke those things when my father was confused and thinking it's not working and I don't know if I can go on. But God's in control and God planned. You need to remember that for your own life. If you're struggling at the moment, God sees the future. That's good news, isn't it? Okay. Uh, so the problem was not having spiritual support. My dad couldn't see how that possibly affected his life at that moment in time. And so fighting with these people, resistant to the thing that he wanted more than anything else, of people getting saved, my dad in late 1969, he said, I've had enough. He resigned and my parents left Eugene, Oregon. <clears throat> and then dad took a church in Carson, California. Carson is kind of near Long Beach. It's one of the, the port areas of, uh, in California. <clears throat> Very small church. I have zero photos of Carson because this was not a happy point in time. He took this church in Carson, California. Uh, my memories of Carson, I have a few. By this time, I'm five years old. All I remember is that we moved there, uh, I think, in October. We trick-or-treated. We scored in the candy department. We were living in a crummy apartment that was infested with ants, and the ants got into our candy. That's what I remember of Carson. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing was that John Metzler came to visit and because uh, he lived in California and he and my dad, they, we were, uh, I was riding my bike out in front of the apartment building and I turned my head to look at them and I ran into a, uh, a garbage, one of those huge garbage receptacles. That's why I have a scar in the middle of my head. That's Carson, California, right there. <laughs> but that's not my dad's memories. Here's, dad took over the church the previous pastor was a woman who retired and she stayed in the church. Oh, you think this is not going to go well. <laughs> Why? <laughs> not only was she in the church, there were seven other female pastors in the church. Yeah, that's how dad felt about it too. <laughs> 
he was like escaping Eugene, but that was frying pan meat fire, right? The church council was made up of women pastors. And of course, they all felt they know, knew how to run the church. By this time, my dad had begun to come to conclusions about pastoral leadership. We'll talk about that later on. My, my, my parents were saved under two lady pastors. Okay, he respected them, loved them, but he began to come to some conclusions, but that was in general, but in this case, he said, this is hell. <laughs> this is not going to work. The previous pastors there, seven other lady pastors, and so he said, for me to be here and pastor this church, I would have to fight and probably they would all wind up, lead. my dad was a man, right? I, I don't think these ladies are going to groove on his ministry and his preaching style. So he said, the only way I could ever build here, I'd have to go through hell fighting them. Probably there would be no choice, but ultimately they'd get mad and leave anyway. And then he said, I don't even like this place. <laughs> At any rate, now all of the years of frustration, not having spiritual support, not seeing sinners saved, the whole kids uh, programs is the key to reaching the world, which is not working. And by this time, my dad had enough. We were there for a total of 90 days. And dad said, I'm out. And he was so discouraged not only did he resign the church, his intention was, I am leaving the ministry. This is not working. And he personalized it. He said, I clearly don't have what it takes. I, I don't like the system and, and the way things are don't work. But he said, maybe it's just me. I don't have what it takes. And so he handed over the keys, wrote a letter of resignation, and he said, I quit the ministry. And he said, his intention was, I am simply going to find a place. By that time, they had five kids. And he said, I am going to find a place where I can raise my family. I'll get a job. I'll leave this whole pastoring thing behind. It's not working for me. And... California is not where I want to raise kids. So he resigned, and he and my mom agreed, we are going to go find some place to raise our family. And so in Christmas, they came, their family lived in Phoenix, Arizona, and his intention was, let's drive and find a place where we can raise a family. So that brings us up to 1970. And then... We will, uh, of course, what happened then is, well, I can't tell you what's going to happen. You won't come, will I? <laughs> Why are you still listening? <laughs> okay, so you see here, but it was out of that, again, God is in control. In the next lesson, I will tell you it was out of that frustration. That is how my parents wound up in Prescott, Arizona. And so I look back now and I say, God, before I thought you were smart, but man, you were really smart. In control. And so my point in, in teaching you, these are lessons that then formed who my father became. But more than that, it formed the, the approach of ministry that we follow to this day. And uh, they all came. They come from some place. It's not dad waking up one morning and going, I got a thought. It came out of what doesn't work, what hurt me, how can I help other people? Let's not do it like that. And those are lessons. And the reason why that's profound is that we have people in our fellowship. I got pastors in our fellowship. They go out and all of a sudden they go, I got a new idea. Let's do it a new way. Why do we need to do it? because you don't understand the background. 
That, that was often, my dad was mystified when the whole Brownsville, Pensacola thing and Toronto blessing, dad would be like, you're crazy. I saw all that nonsense. Why would you want to leave what we have and what works? Because it has a foundation. It has a history. And this is why we do these things. Okay, we'll stop there. Service is going to start at 1030. We're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ this morning. God bless you.